Um, okay, first of all, thank you for coming. When I saw on the uh, timetable that I was next to Richard Simcott, I thought, oh wow, empty room. I may as well not prepare anything. <laughs> so thank you. Um, so today we're going to be talking about why and how to learn a language you've never heard of. Now, this morning, just this morning, I was talking to my mum on Skype, and she said, oh, when's your talk? I said, oh, today. Well, what is it? I'm like, thanks for paying attention there, mum. Um, it's why and how to learn a language you've never heard of. She goes, well, how do you learn a language you've never heard of? And it's like, well, <laughs> that's what the talk's about. And of course, obviously, by the time you get to a point that, by the time you get to the stage of wanting to learn a language, you've heard of it generally because you know the name of the language, right? Um, but we'll talk more about where that name of this talk came from a little bit later on. But first, I know how sometimes not every single moment of these presentations are gripping for everyone in the room. So a little thing to keep your mind busy. Um, what does Courtney Cox have to do with this today? <laughs> okay, there is a connection, and I'll ask you later on to see if anyone spots the connection. Um, but first, let's get quizzical. A little pop quiz for you. <sighs> Room full of polyglots. Have you heard of these languages? And another question, how many speakers do you reckon they have? How many speakers do you reckon these languages have? So they're all real. There's no, there's no tricks, I promise. Um, any ideas? Feel free to shout out. It's all good. George? Which, which one? Oh, they're all different languages, all different numbers of speakers. OK. Chuck? Over a million for all of them? OK. Ah, so you've heard of some of them, yeah? Yeah? I'm here, right? You've heard them. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any languages on here that you haven't heard of? Oh, yes. Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm actually quite impressed by a couple of, a couple of things you said. But this was really surprising. I, all, all data from Wikipedia, by the way. This is where I got all of these uh, numbers. But you can see there's quite a range, right? So something like Jin, which I had never heard of until I wrote it on this slide, right? 48 million speakers. That's like almost the number of people that live in my country. I'm from the UK, if you couldn't guess from the accent. Um, but then all the way to something like Inyapari, four speakers, and that, that stat is from 1999. So I don't know if any of them are still alive, how many of them are still alive, you know? So it's quite a range. And this kind of leads to the first point when I was thinking of this and what I wanted to talk about today, which is that not all languages you've never heard of are endangered, right? Let's just backtrack a little bit. 48 million? Is Jin going to disappear from the face of the earth tomorrow? <laughs> Probably not, <laughs> right? So it's just a thing to think about. Um, but hold up. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. What even is an endangered language? Anyone want to answer that, George? I think it's a language that um, has so few speakers that it becomes really hard to get to promote uh, the learning of it or to um, to teach it in school. So like, and those people are usually uh, elderly, so they're gonna when they die, there might be no speakers left of the language. Okay. Or traces of it. Yeah. Okay, that was good. You can stand up here with the next one. Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, I mean that was good. So next time you can be here presenting, uh -oh. right? You get me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think it would also be a language that doesn't have much of a written record, or, or is maybe often probably, I imagine, be spoken somewhere isolated. So there's probably no people who've been used to using it or any sort of mini recordings. And so they once these people die, that's it, it's gone. Okay, okay, so there's already some common themes coming through, just a couple of answers, both kind of. Sorry, sorry? Right, okay. Yep, this, yeah, that's a really good point. Cool, okay. Sorry, I pointed at the same time. That was not good. Yeah, <laughs> you go first. <laughs>
Ok, ok. Et il y a deux mots. Yeah, so there is, that's, that's completely true. There is this kind of scale of, um, like, I don't know the exact wording of it, but almost like you would see with animals, right, of, like, this red band, then the kind of amber, the yellow, and then the green. Hey, there's lots of, I don't know, dolphins in the world. Are they endangered? Oh. <laughs> maybe, maybe some species, right? But you get the idea, yeah, and it's, it's a similar thing when it comes to endangered languages, and you'll see why I'm using this in just a minute. Um, so here's a few very official definition. So this is the Linguistic Society of America that says, an endangered language is one that is likely to become extinct in the near future. It's pretty straightforward, right? We can all understand that. Here's a very wordy one that I'm not going to read out completely. Um, <laughs> feel free to take a photo if you want to read it later. This is an ethnologue. Have you heard of ethnologue website? They do, yeah, cool. Um, so it's much more descriptive, very, very lengthy in comparison to that much shorter, simpler last definition. And then UNESCO. Um, this one we can kind of read a few things. So no single factor determines whether a language is endangered, which I think from what we just discussed, we can all agree on, right? There's various reasons. It could be isolation. It could not be isolation. There's all sorts of contradictions and stuff going on. Um, so really, <laughs> this, is, this is what that comes down to, is that endangered languages matter because every language matters. And this actually is you could argue is another um, definition. I was speaking last week with, have you heard of Wikitongues? Yeah? Okay, cool, cool. Um, so I was speaking last week with the founders of Wikitongues, and we were talking about this, and you know, I said, why do endangered languages matter? And, they, and one of the founders, Daniel, said to me, well, actually, endangered, I don't really like to use this term, because it does imply, like we just mentioned, this idea of the sort of animal scale of we need to do everything to protect these and less to protect these right now. And, oh, we, we can worry about French later. You know, it kind of creates this weird sort of hierarchy in, in reverse almost. Um, and he said this, you know, endangered languages matter because every language matters. It's not about thinking one is more important to preserve or to study or, you know, whatever you want to do with it than the other. Um, and so that really struck a chord with me. But remember... <laughs> You know, this isn't everything that we're talking about today, right? Not every language you've, heard, you've never heard of is considered endangered. I've added now that word considered, because depending on if you choose to use the term endangered. Um, and there we go. <laughs> There's our examples again of those languages that are definitely not currently considered endangered in any way, shape, or form. So why learn a language, then, that you've never heard of, right? Why? Why would you bother with this, right? Anyone, before I kind of share a few of my thoughts, does anyone have anything you want to say? Any reasons that you might want to learn a language you've never heard of? Awesome. That's really cool. Um, anyone else? Mm -hmm. Cool. So, so you've so far almost got um, <laughs> everything. Um, so yeah, that idea of like access to new cultures and understanding, that sort of preservation idea kind of feeds into that nicely. Travel, personal connections, and dot, 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 right? Whatever it is. All of these things as well could be completely applicable to learning any language, right? I might want to learn, I don't know, Arabic. Um, because it's going to give me access to a new culture and understanding of that culture and those people and that world, right? It may be that I then want to travel to Arabic-speaking countries. It may be that I then have or make personal connections through that language. So any language, the reasons could, could be similar, right? And I guess that's kind of the, the point here is that it's not about thinking, and you'll notice, <laughs> right? It's not about thinking, I want to learn... Let's go back to our list. I want to learn bomb, 
right, with a few hundred speakers in Sierra Leone because, and that dot, dot, dot reason could be, imagine the badge, <laughs> right? <laughs> imagine the badge. I'm going to learn bombs so I can write it on my badge next year. So. No, right? That's never, you, <laughs> exactly. What would be the point? What would be the point? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so, we can make sure. I'll put that on the feedback form. Stickers for bomb spoken in Sierra Leone. Um, but you know, that's, that's not necessarily a reason, and we'll, we'll get onto that. Um, but a little bit about me <laughs> um, and why I'm talking about this. You know, what made me want to talk about this? want to talk about this to you today. That's correct. Um, this is me on my graduation. As you've probably guessed, it's not the official photo. This isn't the one where you have to pose, you know. Um, but I recently, a um, couple of years ago now, finished my degree. It was like a long thing. It was like six years, distance learning, and all of this stuff, right? It took me a long time. Um, and in my final year, I was doing Spanish. That was my final thing that I was doing. And I studied for my very final dissertation about Spanish in different parts of the world. And that was the one that I chose because you had like all these topics that you could choose from and it was like the environment, immigration, you know, geography, all of the, the kind of, the thing that you do with languages that I'm sure you can kind of agree with me this is that I love learning languages because you get to do other stuff, right, within that language. It's not just like grammar, grammar, a bit more grammar and some vocabulary. You actually get to learn and about other subjects through that language, especially if you kind of go on to higher levels and stuff, right? And this really interests me, but the thing was, I didn't care about the renewable energy unit, <laughs> right? I wanted to do the language question. And so I decided for my final dissertation to write about Spanish in various parts of the world. And I picked um, Catalonia in Spain, and the USA, and Paraguay. Because I, I knew a little bit about the USA, I knew a little bit about Spain, but Paraguay, I was like, oh, I'd kind of come across it in like one text article in the, in the course book or something. And I decided, what? This is amazing. Because in Paraguay, there's this language called Guarani. Maybe you've heard of it if you watch any of the videos that were uh, mentioned in the introduction, you've read my blog, whatever. Maybe you've kind of heard me talk about this recently. Um, and what's really interesting, well, we've got some questions about that in a minute. I won't say too much. Um, but I decided to write about the situation in, in, of Spanish in Paraguay, which led to me learning about the existence <laughs> of Guarani, which I didn't know before. It was a language I'd never heard of. Um, and now, in fact, I'm finally going to get the chance to visit Paraguay later, not this year, because January will happen, next year, um, to visit Paraguay and to actually use some of the Guarani that, that I'm learning, which is really exciting. Um, but first, which is, this is the reason I didn't reveal too much. Let's get quizzical again. Second pop quiz. A few questions. Where is Guarani? Ah, oh, I've already given you the answer to the first one. <laughs> um, where is Guarani spoken? How many speakers? What language family? How do verbs conjugate? And what writing systems do they use? So, where is Guarani spoken? Paraguay. Anywhere else? A little bit Argentina. L someone say Bolivia. Yeah, a little bit Bolivia and a little bit Brazil, right? So kind of Paraguay and then kind of, you know, around. Um, how many speakers? Ooh, I'm impressed. You can be up here next year as well. We can get a little trio thing going on. You, you and George, me, yeah? We'll, we'll present together, it's good. I, you've, you've, I love it, right. Um, what language family? Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, Tupi Guarani is the name of the, yeah. Um, how do verbs conjugate? Any way they want. If only that was true for every language <laughs> ever. <laughs> like, <laughs> this, this whole polyglot thing, we would have a badge for bomb. It would be amazing. Um, yeah, verbs are kind of fun, right? So with, uh, with, with a, who learns, I don't know, French, Spanish, Italian, yeah? Hands up, okay, yeah. We all know at least one of these languages that maybe you've got like the person bit, like I, you, he, she, and then you've got the verb, and then this bit that you add on the end of the verb is the thing that tells you when, who, what is going on, etc. right? 
<laughs> when in Guarani, what's really interesting, and maybe you, you've come across, this is the best place to ask this question in a room full of uh, people like us. Maybe you've come across a language that does this already, but this was the first time I had. In Guarani, those bits that, that change it go in front of the verb. Has anyone ever come across that in another language? Yes. Which languages? I'm curious. Farsi. Swahili. Swahili. Ab Abenaki. Is that, for, is that a... Ah, oh, cool, cool. Oh, cool. Interesting. Hebrew. Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> Hebrew is the language, then, that we need to base all other languages on for future verb conjugation, right? Just... True. Yeah? <laughs> we'll go with that. Um, <laughs> so so this, is, this is my point, right? I had never, ever come across a language with a verb that conjugated in front. But, of course, now... I know there's so many. So if I then went on to learn Farsi or was it Al Abenaki, Abenaki, or Hebrew, then I would like get to that page where it's like verbs conjugated the front of the verb. I'd be like, perfect. I know that. Let's, let's, I know how to do that. I know what that means. I can go quicker, right? Um, what writing system do they use? Yeah, it's a bit of a trick question. Um, this one, <laughs> right? Same as us. Um, so yeah. So yeah, six eight million, two big Guarani at the front, and this one. And yeah, how old? Oh, now you're testing me. Well, it's older than Spanish. It's it's there's there's so some. It's older than Spanish. The rating system originally could not have been that. No, but there was yeah, there was no writing system. Ah. Yeah, yeah. There may have there may have been something that yeah, there may have been something. There may have been some kind of way, you know, but yeah, there's, it was like a case of, okay, I think it was like mis Jesuit missionaries kind of went in and were like, we need to write this down, you know, and just did it in what they knew. Um, okay, which of these English words come from Guarani? Because maybe you're feeling like, maybe you walked in here, you kind of never really heard of Guarani, you're thinking like, ah, there's no connection to English, but there is. Yes. Piranha? Okay. Alpaca? You think it comes from Guarani? Yeah. Okay. Sorry? Paraguay. Very smart guess. That is correct. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All of them? Okay, who thinks all of them? I think Richard. But I said earlier I wasn't tricking you. It's all good. <laughs> who thinks all of them? What? You think all of them? Yeah. Okay, who thinks there's some in there that aren't from Guarani? Okay. You guys are correct. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so there's just a few, just a few. So yeah, wiki. This is really fun. Uh, it's actually it means fast. It's from Hawaiian. Puma from Quechua, jerky from Quechua, which is was news to me, and alpaca, which is from Mai Mai, which is spoken on the sort of other side of uh, Latin America, um, or South America, I should say. Sorry. No, no, no. Not the same. They're not the same. Yeah, the black ones, yeah, sorry. The black ones are, like, not from Guarani, not related in any way. Um, but also it, in English, right? So Jaguar, Cougar, Uruguay, Piranha, Agouti, Tapir, Achai. Have you seen this lately? Who, who was the lunch we were talking about, the kombucha? It's like this latest trend. This is another one, right? A, a, a side bowl? Like, I see this all over the place. Um, and Paraguay are all from Guarani originally. In fact, this is really interesting. The etymology of um, Paraguay and Uruguay as, as words is not like set in stone. Like, you know, people like to kind of say, it was this way, no, it was that way, and all of that. Um, but it's, to me, it's kind of clear, right? So this, the, the Y at the end means water in Guarani. This Gua is like uh, from, so I would say like England or I kind of do a thing like Inglaterra, Gua, right? Um, and then para is um, something that I've forgotten. <laughs> but it's basically like saying from the water, like people from the water, something like that. Or the, ri the sea from the water, the river from the water, something like that, right? That's the one that I don't know. And that's the one that's kind of like more debated because they don't actually speak Guarani, as far as I'm aware, in Uruguay. So it's kind of, the name has kind of got this connection. But I mean, if it does, if, if, the, if this version of, of the sort of etymology is correct, but like I say, it's debated and stuff. 
um, then it would be like something from the water, or the water from another place, like a lake called Uri or something like that. Yeah. Um, okay. Have you guessed the connection yet? I told you she'd be back. <laughs> no? No. <laughs> that would be way too obvious. Who is she? Who is she? Oh, uh, Monica from Friends. Yeah, yeah. No? No guesses? No? Okay. Courtney Cox was in a TV show called Cougar Town. <laughs> And cougar is a Guarani word. This is the original word, uh, guasa, guasuarana, right? That's the original word via Latin and then via French, then cougar. Um, yeah, so you can see. I told you she'd be back. Um, yeah, and I just wanted to share, like, specifically about Guarani, a few other interesting things that I've learned since I've started. Um, and this kind of links to the idea of, you know, why do this? Because of this cool stuff that I've, well, this is a war, this isn't cool, but you know, the <laughs> interesting stuff that, that I've learned as a part of it. So there's this thing called terere, which is like a huge thing in, in Paraguay. Have you ever been to Argentina or yeah, maybe you've heard of like yerba, the mate, the drink? You, they drink it hot, right? Yeah? So in Paraguay, they drink it cold um, and it's huge. Like they just have like a, a, either like a jug or you know those big flasks that you can get? And people will carry this around in the streets with a glass like this and the straw. These metal straws are very, very cool. I went to um, a Paraguayan restaurant. I was in New York last week. And, uh, and yeah, they gave us some of this stuff. And the straw und underneath is like, uh, like got holes in. And it's a big round thing. And you can, like, so it doesn't get the stuff. Yeah, it's really, really cool. Um, and yeah, so people would just literally, I've seen <laughs> pictures of like Paraguayans. So if they walk in, with their, just carrying the, their jug of stuff. It's insane. And you share it. Even, even last week when I was in that restaurant, um, the guy that served us was like, oh, yeah, here you go. Here's a terere. And here's, your, here's the one glass, one of, just one of those between me and my husband. And then he's like, this is a really shared experience. You know, maybe like with some cultures you would, uh, I don't know, eat bread together or go and have a beer together or whatever, right? And he said, but for us, we share the terere. And then he just grabbed it off the table that he just served, the glass that he just served, <laughs> took a big slurp and put it back down. And then came over, how, oh, how was the dinner? Bien, bien. They're like, ah, oh, si, muy bien, bien. And he came, poured some more. <laughs> this is new. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's a, that's a huge thing, which is really interesting. Um, another thing that's really interesting about, about uh, Paraguay and, and it's kind of affected the language as well, is there's a thing called the War of the Triple Alliance. Have you heard of this? It was, it was a war... Um, in Latin America, long story short, kind of Paraguay is in the middle. Everyone around them was kind of ganging up <laughs> on them, essentially, in a way. I don't, I don't know the details. Um, but basically, Paraguay was almost destroyed. 70% of Paraguay men died, which, which meant that the country almost disappeared. It was like you, s you kind of see this gif online of the war happening and like the zones and stuff, and, the boop, 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 and then it just gradually comes back. Um, so the pre-war population of 525,000 estimated reduced to 221, just 28,000 of those were men. So Guarani, in terms of, like, I guess, sort of modern times, would be a real example of, like, fe you know, girl power, whatever, <laughs> because <laughs> women brought this language back. You know, they, they had babies with the few men that were there and with men from, from other places, and, and then they spoke Guarani to their children because that was their language. So <laughs> it's quite a beautiful thing to come out of you know, such a horrible situation being war. Um, and another really cool thing I've learned is that I love glottal stops and nasals. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah, so many. Like the word for language in itself is N with a squiggle, E apostrophe, which is the uh, glottal stop, and then another E with a squiggle. So it's like nye -e, nye -e. Oh, So fun to say. The whole word for Guarani is like It's good. It's good fun. I have to do this. I'm still a learner. I'm still kind of <laughs> for my nasals, I kind of yeah. Um, so a little bit onto then about the how. 
how did I do this? Because, and I'll be honest, when I first started, I kind of thought like, okay, yeah, it's fine. I'll, I'll be going there. So I'll be able to, you know, even if I can't do anything in the build-up, I'll get there, it'll be fine. But actually, I've been really pleasantly surprised with how much there is to help me learn this language. There's no teach yourself course. There's no colloquial course. There's no uh, another popular, famous course that you can normally get in any language, right? It doesn't exist. But that said, don't instantly rule those out. If you're thinking, if you've got some kind of curiosity about a language that you don't really know much about, maybe it's kind of lesser studied, don't rule out these, these sort of bigger resources. Um, Duolingo has a course in Guarani in Spanish, but it has a course in Guarani. Um, so I'm doing that. There's a closed master. Have you heard of this? Yeah, yeah, pretty, pretty new thing, very, very cool, kind of similar to like memorized Duolingo style, but it's words in context. Um, and they have Guarani. And I was, I, I was talking to you, Kirsten, when this happened. I was like, oh, oh they have Guarani. I'm in. Yeah. Um, but then also, you know, don't just skip past these things. This is memorized. I just searched Guarani. You've got one, two, three, four, five. It's not masses, but it's, it's enough. And there's something, yeah. Mm, mm -hmm. mm. <laughs> Could you ask? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How many people had heard of Esperanto because of Duolingo? Ah, more. Good job, Chuck. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, you know, these kind of resources that are pretty typical that we would expect. And you'll see this is a common theme. I have an italki tutor. There's one tutor. I had to go all the way down to the other tab, but there's one guy, and he's very, very good. Um, we haven't yet had the chance to have too many lessons together, but he's great. Um, and you know, something like a low talk or tandem, these things that you would normally think, well, it's not going to be on there, it's not on the list. If you, if you know like, where it's spoken or whatever, you can think, okay, it's spoken in Paraguay, so are there Spanish speakers from Paraguay? Maybe they speak Guarani, right? Um, and this, is, this has been a huge thing. Because there is no course book, there is no like one solid thing that I can go, this is my main thing, and then I'm using Duolingo, Italki, whatever, right? I found this website called LiveLingua, and they've collected, maybe you've heard of like the FSI, um, or the DLI, or the Peace Corps, it, Peace Corps, right? That's so weird for me to say. I just want to say corpse every time. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and they've kind of collected them all in one place. These are all free resources. They're kind of like a little bit old. They're not the best, but it's something. It's a start. And sometimes that's all you need. You just need something to kind of be your, your core base that you can keep coming back to. Um, and actually having less, I found to be really inspiring almost. It makes me want to make the most of that less that I do have. Does that make sense? Um, so yeah, they have one, not in the FSI, not the DLI, but the Peace Corps one in Guarani. So I'm using that too. YouTube, um, in a few ways. <laughs> um, songs were one of the first things that I looked up on YouTube. There's no kind of Guarani teacher there, um, but there's some songs. Dubbed film clips has been, uh, this, this channel in particular, um, it's probably highly illegal. Please don't take too many photos because I don't want it to get <laughs> taken down. Um, <laughs> but they dub like clips of really popular, kind of generally English films and TV shows and whatever into Guarani. And they do a good job of it. It's really, really helpful. Um, so I watched a lot. Um, the, you know the sloth scene from Zootopia? Where they go into the... Yeah, 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 that's great because he goes, hello. <laughs> so I've really perfected my pronunciation of the word hello. Bye, Shapa. Nailed it. Um, so uh, in that there are a few. There are a few lessons. You know, it depends kind of what language. But also things like podcasts or Spotify. You know, music and, and podcasts. If you kind of dig deep enough, then you you can find something. Um, Wikipedia has been surprisingly big. I never really thought about using Wikipedia for language learning before. You know, I just kind of thought, yeah, it's a thing, um, and it exists in other languages. That's cool. But actually, there's like the Wikipedia for Guarani has 3,000 pages. So that's 3,000 pages of reading material that I can use. And the great thing is, of course, you can click through. So if I read something, I'm like, I don't know what that word means. Generally, you know, you can kind of click through around the word. You can kind of 
play, uh, what's that game people used to play? Wiki, wiki races? Did you ever play that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you get from like lamp to computer just by clicking on Wikipedia pages um, to kind of find out what stuff means. But also, beyond Wikipedia itself, you've got wiki books. And uh, I was trying to be uh, respectful of being here in Montreal in this bilingual city, <laughs> little French and English. Uh, wiki books and wiktionary. Um, which may exist for the language that you're thinking of learning too. And finally, social media. If you know anything about me, you know that I'm pretty big <laughs> on using social media for languages. Um, so I found a few pages to follow on Facebook, sharing things here and there on Instagram, but also, you know, wherever, wherever you prefer to be on social media, there's probably someone there. And the great thing about using social media for this, especially for a language where there's less resources, um, you know, we've gone beyond now. We're not talking just about endangered languages here. Um, it's that there's people there, <laughs> there's real people. You know, it's not just a, a kind of book from the Peace Corps in 1995, it's actual modern people. Like I found a page where they are, um, it's the Linguistic Society of Paraguay. And I think last week, maybe even going into this week, they had this week of speak Guarani. And it was like all across the country. So it's been really interesting to kind of follow that. And they post in this uh, Guarani Spanish kind of mix, which is really cool. Um, but beyond that, these are things that I haven't found for Guarani personally, but things that I tried in the process. Generally, if you're stuck for podcasts, um, there's religious stuff. There's, you know, if, if it interests you, if it doesn't interest you, it, it exists. There is audio, there is text that you can kind of use if you're really, really stuck for resources, and that's some place that, you know, that you'd be able to find it is generally for religions. Academic texts as well, you know, kind of at the other end of the scale, um, you then have people who will go out to these isolated islands and think, I want to study this, I want to find out more. And they'll write a very academic, jargon-filled paper <laughs> that may not be that accessible, but if that's all you've got, it could be a start. Um, and also kind of hunting around online, you know, see if there are any books or anything like that you can find. And news, if it exists in a language, news can be a great source as well. Um, okay. This is the bit. <laughs> it's not Courtney Cox anymore. She's gone. She's gone. She's in the past. Um, this is the bit I was really, honestly, very uncomfortable about talking about. But the more I was re doing research for this uh, presentation, the more this, this thing kept coming up. And I was like, okay, maybe I just need to address this and kind of see what you, know, see what you think. So I just want to show you some stuff. I don't know if you can read it. Is it big enough? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> You using sign language is cultural appropriation. You're taking something from deaf people, people who have beautiful culture and language, and butchering it. I don't want to come off rude or anything, but you should probably stop speaking Spanish unless you're of Hispanic heritage. Otherwise, it's cultural appropriation, and I don't think you're of Hispanic heritage because you look white from any of the pictures you posted, so please stop speaking learning Spanish. Thank you. <sighs> wow, please learn to use pronunciation. Um, no, that's Spanish for no. Um, <laughs> <laughs> pro tip. Don't learn a language if you do not come from the language bearers, i.e. don't learn French if you're not French. Don't learn Chinese if you're not Chinese. Don't learn Icelandic if you're not Icelandic. It just appropriates culture more. Okay, sounds good. I'll go tell all of Francophone Africa. They have to start talking in clicks again. <laughs> Picks up the phone. Hey, Dad, remember how you adopted? Yeah, we can't talk to Grandma anymore. It's damaging our country. <laughs> right. So, oh, oh, oh. Oh, this, oh no, where have I gone? Oh no, oh, it's not comfortable. Oh, <laughs> I don't feel comfortable talking about this. I'm like white girl from England, like UK, you know, we colonized half the world and now I'm telling like, culture appropriation, why am I talking about this? Oh, right? This is my sister's dog, by the way, I didn't. <laughs> Isn't he cute? Um, but th there, is, there is a serious point to this and the more I was reading, I was like, I, I really, I think even more now, more than ever, it's important to try and see other people's point of view. So kind of going beyond those initial sort of Tumblr screenshots that I found, I was like, okay, let me try and understand why people would think this. Um, and I think it does have to be perhaps more considered and acknowledged when you're learning a language that, is, that you've never heard of. You know, it could be endangered, it could not be. It could be lesser studied, generally that's gonna be the case. And when you're thinking, okay, I want to learn this, that's awesome. We're a room full of polyglots. You know, we, we love this stuff. This is what we do, right? But it's just considering that there may be some people who can't learn the language, who have reasons to, or who would want to. 
because of various things, right? Personal and literacy levels. Maybe people can't read and write, so they can only speak the language. They can only kind of access half of that. Maybe there's no access to the technology or the internet where there are some resources that so much of what I just mentioned is internet-based, right? Maybe um, they need to study other languages first for work or for study. Um, you know, and I'm not saying this to put you off. <laughs> I'm saying it, like I said, because the more kind of research I did for this, the more I found, like, okay, I just want just to address this. <laughs> um, yeah, so it, it's just worth being aware of. And I think also that, I mean, like I say, I'm not the person to stand here and say, do this, don't do this, right? That's not what I'm here for. Um, but I found this, this quote, which I really kind of appreciated, and I'm sure we can all agree with, um, in an article, and I'll link to this at the end, called On Learning Indigenous Languages by uh, Abby Francamont. Um, and it says, oh, I'll let you read it while I take a drink. Okay. Um, there was one bit in particular. I can't remember. Have you, have you read it? Do you want me to read it out loud? Okay. You cannot learn Quechua without its context. You cannot learn Quechua without knowing how the high Andes smell at dawn. You cannot learn it without eating watia. Nobody cares if it's spelled wakatai or wakatai. They care if you know what it's for. You do not speak Quechua with true comfort and real fluency if the cold doesn't make you hiss alalao and the voices in your head are never repeating amasua, ama lulua, ama kela. <laughs> if you've never bitten off a piece of rock hard yiptin for the wad of leaves in your mouth, so you could work harder, walk further, and persevere longer, then there is no translation of amakela that will ever convey it all. And I feel like this is it. This is what it's about. It's the idea of actually not learning a language in isolation, not just doing that Guarani Duolingo course, not just reading my book from the Live Lingua website, right? It's actually meeting people and, and engaging with people. So it really just means that you're kind of, your reason and and everything, you know, why are you doing this? It really matters. It's not for the badge. You know, maybe there will be flags next year if enough people decide to take up bomb. <laughs> but that's not the reason. It's so that you could speak with those speakers of bomb and just making sure that that's a just reason, you know, and thinking that you can do a better job of saving a language, that's, that's not a just reason. You know, it's not, that's not your job. You can definitely kind of learn something and connect with people, with native speakers, and work in terms of preservation, et cetera, et cetera. If you're doing this on your own, like, I am Superman. <laughs> I'm going to come in and save this language. It's going to be amazing. It's like, you can, you can collaborate, but it's, it's not to be seen as on your own, as kind of put up there as this hero. That's not, that's not what it's for. I'm sure you can all agree. Um, so back to kind of where we sort of started earlier. Uh, earlier? <laughs> earlier on. Um, why learn these languages? Well, the same reason that you would learn any language. For your reasons that you define that acknowledge and respect native speakers. And I think that's really the kind of bottom line of everything, including all the uncomfortable stuff that we've, <laughs> that we've ended up talking about today. Um, and yeah, that's, that's really um, it. I'll leave this up. There's this one and there's another page. <laughs> if you want to grab your phones, this is the page to take a photo of. Um, so these are some of the links that I read when I was um, kind of doing the research. This one is the one that I quoted from. Um, the, one, the one that's on the everydayfeminist.com, that's the one that made me kind of go, oh, do I need to talk about this? Um, and the ones above, there's some really positive stuff too. You know, it's not all like doom and gloom or anything like that. Um, so yeah, there's some good stuff. There's like people that are young, you know, young people as well. Like we mentioned earlier about the idea of just being elderly speakers. There's some real positive stories here of young people using social media, et cetera, et cetera, um, to learn. Has everyone got a photo of this who wants this? Because there's another slide for photos. This one, in terms of uh, resources, in terms of where to start, kind of going beyond, um, you know, what you might expect, like the Duolingo, the Memorize, et cetera. Um, so there's some links there for various languages. Um, yeah. And, okay, <laughs> focus, <laughs> and that is it, cool, thank you.
thank you. How are we for time? Ah, good. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, was that good for time? Perfect. Yay. Um, within your family for any kind of dementia, it's much slower if there's all those uh, ganglial connections um, you, because what happens is one part of your brain starts slowing down, others just pick up the slack. So languages and math are really good for families that are prone to some sort of dementia. Mm -hmm. so it's <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> that is just a language. The only reason you can't do it is because you said, I can't do it. Yeah. If you got rid of Fixed that mindset. Ridiculous thinking, okay, Jeff there can it. teach it to you in a second. <laughs> Before you leave today, sit down with Jeff and say, Jeff, teach me differential calculus. <laughs> <laughs> I told I you you should be up here. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I'm going to try to speak loud for a little laryngitis. No problem. Um, I, I, I grew up across the border in the U.S., just literally across. And half the students in my school were from Mohawk. And I loved the sound of Mohawk. For me, the sound of the language is a reason to learn it. But I found that there's no help in it. Mm. That I'm this. Yeah, this is a really interesting thing. And the, the article on the kind of first one um, kind of touched on this idea that actually, and, and that's why I said, like, you know, it's not your language to save. In some ways, for some languages, it's not your language to learn. Um, you know, and the idea that it's very personal and it's so integrated into culture that it's not a case of, well, I'll learn the language to learn the culture because the culture isn't yours in the first place, you know. And there are definitely cases where I think that's, that's it. And... You know, I've been very um, kind of wary, to be honest with you. When I, when I first sort of started learning Guarani, I was like, perfect. They, you know, like Guarani and Spanish, I don't think I mentioned. It's, it's what's really fascinating. It's not just a case of, oh, it's an indigenous language and Spanish is used for everything. No, like because of the whole, the war thing and, you know, the women like bringing it back, it's actually got a really, really strong status. And there's nowhere that I've come across, at least, um, that has that kind of indigenous language, colonial language, pretty much side by side. Quechua, is, is it as, even, is it like an official? Is it official, is it? Like government and everything? Oh, wow, okay. Okay, so, so yeah, so there, so there are some, like, success stories, if you like. Um, but that doesn't mean, then, that, like, um, Mohawk, for example, not wanting to be learned by someone else is not a success story. You know, I'm using success story loosely there. But, yeah, it's, thank you for sharing, because I think... Okay. Uh, for children, and they've over now over a generation or two have been teaching kids in Mohawk, so they've built up the number of people, and a lot of the new communities are now looking at the success of Mohawk in bringing the language back from the brink. You know? Yeah. But still, the outsiders wanting to learn it is still a little delicate issue. Yeah, and that's definitely something that has to be. You know, that's, that's definitely a reason why it's not just a case of, here's the one resource that I found on the internet, so now I'm just going to go all in. You know, it's kind of actually acknowledging and respecting the, the people, which, you know, ties in, I guess, to... Okay, yeah. No way, really? Yes, it was developed for a community of Mohawks on this side of the border. Ah. Uh, so it's a slightly different dialect from what I heard you, you know, say, but... Um, mm. Yeah. But how can you bring Mohawk to uh, Yeah, absolutely. No, thank you. I'm really, really glad that you brought that up. Thank you. Yes. I just wanted to say that I have this thing to Paraguay that I've never got a Paraguayan. Mm. And uh, in Paraguay, even if you're not a member of like, you know, the native community, like people who 
Yes. Oh yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. No. I. Yeah. No. I. I agree. There's. There's. Um. So like the Duolingo course is actually this. There's like there's Guarani. There's Spanish, and then there's Jopara, which is what the Duolingo course is based on, which is kind of a mix. So when I first started, and I was then, and it's in Spanish, right? And it comes up, it's like, you know, like lesson one of Duolingo, Apple, right? So it's like manzana. It showed me the picture of this apple. I'm going, hang on a minute. It's giving me the Spanish. Why is it not, why is it not got the Guarani? It's like, oh, this is the Guarani. Well, this is going to be easy. Okay. <laughs> you know, and so that's kind of the mix in between. So, yeah, I think, um, and that's, that's what I mean when I say the idea of, like, how it's so strong. It's because... It's not just a case of the indigenous people speak it. It's like become national language alongside Spanish. It's, it's yeah. incredible. Language. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I read part of why it was like Spanish speaking language concept. So like nobody knew that the girls were bilingual. They were like fifty percent of the Spanish speaking. But they so, so they we all asked them. Like, oh yeah, I speak to my car. I speak to my neighbor with my parents. I speak to my neighbor with my friends. I speak to my English project. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. So we gave you the impression that it's like everybody. Yeah. Yeah. So if you don't, you're kind of out of the loop. Yeah, yeah. There are very few Brits who speak it. I don't know. I'll try and find some. <laughs> Anyone else? Melanie, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So here in um, Montreal, I mentioned about being in the restaurant last week in New York. So this is like the start of a, a year-long trip for me and my husband. Um, we're actually traveling in, mostly in Latin America, um, making films about language. And for, for, for me, like, I speak Spanish. I, my degree is Spanish, right? So I was like, well, how am I going to learn languages for a year if I go to this place that speaks a language I already know? Um, and so I was like, of course, there's so many indigenous languages I could have chosen from, but having had that like exposure to Guarani before, I was like, okay, maybe that's the one. And it's kind of like at the end of the trip, so it gives me more time to really get my teeth into it and stuff. Yeah, that would I say. That that's what I would say was the kind of motivation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one, I think you touched on this briefly, but just to further emphasize, uh, there are a lot of languages out there that are well documented and even have uh, textbooks for learners, but they don't. Mm -hmm. that came uh, from uh, my family. And I thought it was interesting to hear that. And, you know, what, why would anyone not want you to learn their language? And I realized, well, when I hear people who are not Jewish or don't have any connection to the Jewish people from New York, that they're learning Hebrew, I think, okay, well, there's a Bible that the property of the world, I guess. But uh, when they say they want to learn Yiddish, Some, some, 
Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Which is, which, yeah, this, this all ties in. I'm, I'm so glad you're saying this. Because, yeah, th this idea of, like, acknowledging the, the people and the culture beyond just the, the bad, you know. It's, <laughs> you know, it's not, it's not like, um, and this is another thing that one of the Wikitongs guys said, you know, it's not Pokemon. It's not like you've got to catch them all, you know. It's, it's, it's th there has to be kind of something. And that, that reason can simply be because I want to, because I'm curious. And, you know, if you want to, the want has to lead to wanting to interact with and learn about the people rather than just, oh, I can speak your language. You know, it's, it's not helpful. It's not helpful. Yeah. Anyone else? Kyle. Was it that heavy? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, what gua? So the oh the oh oh, good question. Ah, oh, because the gua in Paraguay and the yeah. I'll ask my tutor next time I speak with him, possibly. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, that would make sense. Ah, oh, language brains in the room. <laughs> I love it. Uh, yeah. That's a very, very good question. And I think it's, it's going to vary widely from language to language. You know, like if you were to try and convince a Mohawk speaker that you're in it for the right reasons, it's probably going to be very different to me learning and speaking with a native Guarani speaker, the same as a Yiddish speaker, the same as a Quechua speaker. Um, but I guess it's, it, 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 if it was to come down to kind of like one thing, it would probably be just connection in some way and an honest connection with a very open curiosity, I suppose. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's impossible to, to kind of say like one thing, like a one size fits all. Yeah, sorry, I can't answer it better. <laughs> yeah. Okay, oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 That's a really yeah. Thank you. That's a really uh, valuable. That's a chat. Okay. That's a real, yeah, no, welcome. Yeah. 
<laughs> yeah. We've got we've got to get to work, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, no, you're definitely welcome to, to say that. That's a really good point. I'm going to, I I have a request about the app, but I'll tell you later. And then, uh, <laughs> technical thing. <laughs> um, is that about it? Yeah. So I guess I think that's it. Thank you so much.